world. So it turns out you're actually meant to review game series in chronological order, meaning that doing my very first point and quickie review on Broken Sword 2 was a hilariously stupid idea. But that's what I was playing at the time, on a handheld console of all things, and then I had to complete the PC version to capture the footage. Basically, I went ahead and reviewed that in the most awkward way possible. Still no excuse for why it took four goddamn months, though. Anyway, there's a reason I'm bringing it up besides recycling old review footage. I'd mentioned how the second game had nothing to do with the overarching plot of the series, and I didn't really say much more than that. The Smoking Mirror revolves around ancient Mayan artifacts, whereas the majority of the Broken Sword games are based around the Knights Templar in the modern day. I would say that should be obvious given the subtitle of the first game, but apparently it was initially released in North America as Broken Sword Circle of Blood, as befits a game lacking any circles made of blood. I also haven't played beyond game number two in this series, so I couldn't tell you if the events of The Smoking Mirror are just forgotten by the time the sequels roll round. With all that out of the way, Let's dig into how the series got started. As always, story first. So George Stobart, the most lovable of bastard protagonists, yes. begins with a monologue about the beauty of Paris in the fall and oh god I don't care. The opening credits playing over a landscape view of the city does look very nice though, certainly would have looked great at the time. Skip ahead a bit and our George is chilling in a cafe. When a clown shows up, walks in and runs the fuck back out clutching a briefcase. I'm not a cool rofo by any means, but the clown showing up at all would have been a red flag for me. And in this case, I would have been totally right, because... Yeah, that. George survives... And finds out the briefcase's original owner is dead. After being interrogated by a psychic detective, at least that's what he thinks, George meets photojournalist Nicole Collard, who shows up to photojournalise the scene of the crime. He decides to scan the area for clues, because, let's face it, patent lawyers are all about that shit. And he begins his investigation with nothing but a newspaper and a mild grudge against clowns. And, frankly, who could blame him? Within the first hour, you'll find a link to the Knights Templar, which isn't a spoiler because title. And you'll embark on an international adventure of mystery, wonder and questionable accents. And a bunch of jokes directed at Americans and the police for some reason. Oh, don't shoot. I'm innocent. I'm an American. Can't make up your mind, huh? Now, at this point, I could basically show you the interface section from my first review again because there would be precious little change between them. Fortunately, I'm more professional than that, but it's a two-button interface so dedicated to showing you the full-screen graphical lovelies that it's even context-sensitive. Right-click gives a description of things, and left-click does whatever the cursor displays at the time. Actions like take, use, or examine, which sounds the same as look, but examine is either a bit more in-depth or a shorthand for George gives you a smart-ass remark about why he's not going to do anything with this. Your inventory lives at the top of the screen and only shows up when your mouse cursor comes to visit. You can combine things, you can click things to grab them and use them in the world. Nothing fancy, but what else do you really need? As long as you don't need a special device to combine inventory items that makes the process take twice as long, I'm quite happy. And there's a nice immersion building touch when you see the various clues and phone numbers George discovers get written on the back of an envelope, especially the wee caricature of Nicole next to her number. Graphically, games 1 and 2 are on par with each other. Revolution Software had moved away from the standard VGA game graphics of their previous titles, the fondly remembered Beneath a Steel Sky and the comparatively obscure Lure of the Temptress. Broken Sword instead adopted a more cartoon type of style. Sounds a bit dumb to say, I mean, Dave the Tentacle could easily be labelled as having a cartoon style, but Broken Sword went a step further by actually looking like a cartoon. For all its typical VGA game graphic stylings, Beneath a Steel Sky has some very detailed animation, which Broken Sword does not let up on. If you put this footage on a VHS tape, because DVDs hadn't been invented yet, you could easily mistake this for a kid's TV show, especially when you take the music into account. They weren't content with just moving away from MIDI. This is pretty far from standard video game background music. It slides from grand orchestral scores to subtle dreamlike tones, and unless you were looking for the cuts, it sounds like each piece flows into the other. Just make sure you set the volume sliders right at the beginning. Sometimes it gets a little overpowering. There's a slight drawback to putting all that attention into graphics though. Because they painstakingly animated every single action that they reasonably could, everything feels very slow. Hardly the worst criticism for a point to collect to have, it's a genre built on thought and story. And technical limitations I suppose, but that's not relevant to my point and therefore would be a useless addition to the review that I'll need to make sure I leave out of the script. Oh bollocks. And this would have worked at the time the game was released merely due to its presence. Even the classic games of the genre use a limited number of reused animations. Walking, talking, grabbing items, they cut those corners because 
because the hardware they had to work with restricted them. It's half the damn reason this genre exists as far as I'm concerned. I think we would have all been enthralled by these detailed animations, the kind we'd normally have to see in a cinema or on that VHS tape you had which wasn't available in the stores but your parents insisted was absolutely fine to have but don't tell anybody at school just in case. These days, the fact that a record number of frames were drawn for a guy picking up a newspaper ain't so special. If you find point click games are usually quite slow for you, this will probably be your exit point. You can't skip them either, only individual lines of dialogue, and that can be a pain in the arse on a second playthrough. That said, the conversation system is rather to the point. You don't get lines of dialogue to pick, you get icons representing the topics. There isn't even a generic talking option, it's specific topics or none. Man, even Toonstruck had a generic banter button. Granted, that might have just been a way to get yet another pun in there. Something I think Broken Sword should be known for is having good writing, even just some of the witty one-liners. But mostly for the fact that the people you meet are actual characters. Some are a little one-sided, sure, but they're entertaining and you can understand who they are without them spouting their entire life story at you. Especially this woman in the hotel. There's something wonderfully free about an older lady who no longer gives a shit about anything but having fun. Good heavens! You're a private detective. That's correct, ma'am. What's the term you Americans use? I believe what you're thinking of is dick. Precisely. Finally, there's one thing which cannot be missed out when talking about Shadow of the Templars. It's so well known, I had heard about it before I even owned a copy of the game. The GOAT PUZZLE. The short version is, it's a goat-based puzzle so legendarily illogical that it actually got tweaked for the director's cut. The long version is, as it happens, longer. I mean, how many game puzzles do you know that have their own Wikipedia page? Here's what happens. When George travels to Ireland, see, I told you this was international, he attempts to access a dig site inside a castle and the goat blocks the way, butting you down any time you approach. What made this difficult, apart from the minor logical leap required, is that it's time critical, a type of puzzle which hasn't been utilised up to this point in the game and is pretty rare for this genre at all. And I'm sure people are sick of me talking about this, but opening up a web browser and looking up a walkthrough simply wasn't a feasible option back then. At best, I'd have to get on a bus, go to town, find an internet cafe, pay them the money and then either write down the solution or hope they had a printer. It just had to happen that way. This would have easily stumped people for days. There is a silver lining to all this though. The goat is tied up in a small area with limited vegetation and probably only has rainwater to drink. By the time the sequel rolls around, that goat is fucking dead. On the other hand, it would probably chew through the rope at some point and lay terror to the populace, leaving fire and fear in its wake. What was I talking about? Mm. If you want a real mind bender or somehow actually enjoy Moon Logic, have a go. Everybody else, feel free to look up a walkthrough and get on with the game. Because the goat puzzle is easily the worst this game has to offer and it's just one puzzle in what's a really great adventure. I like to think people don't buy remakes of 13 year old games unless they were actually good in the first place. Which this game is, in case I didn't make that obvious. So hopefully that covers the first Broken Sword game. It's the series that Revolution Software are best known for, and probably for good reason. If it were purely working off the novelty of the animation, it would have never made it into 3D, nor would the Kickstarter for The Serpent's Curse have necessarily got its funding. It's the story and writing that carry it, like a good pointy-click shoot, and I feel that's the reason people really want to see George and Nico's next improbable adventure. You can get both the original and the director's cut versions very easily. The director's cut has a more stark cartoon style and I personally prefer the original, but the DC also includes some quality of life improvements and a brand new prequel section where you play as Nico. So that's as good a way to make your choice as any. If you don't mind a game that takes its time, play it. There's a reason it's called a classic.